right, so here we are. Let's do the January 2005 multiple choice at least. Let's see how we get going here. See how we do. All right, so rock on here. Uh, wrong way. Let me make this smaller. So my hope today is that you guys start seeing some serious patterns in these tests. This is another one of our reviews where we kind of see the questions and see what's going on behind the questions. Not just the question, it's what the concept is behind the question because you're going to see very similar questions if you do enough tests. They keep asking the same kind of questions. So I keep telling my students, they're looking for um, uh, the same answers for different questions. So you've got to start seeing that. So let's try to do that. All right, so let's be crazy and go in order. Okay. Or just go crazy. So here we go. Number one. Let's make that nice, big, and personal. As an electron, an atom moves from the ground state to the excited state, the electron does what? Well, you should know the ground state is closer to the nucleus. And the excited state is farther away. The nucleus is positive. So if I'm moving from a ground state, which you know is stable, low energy, it's where it belongs, to an excited state, excited means you have energy, you must have absorbed energy. So electrons are moving farther away from the atom. So they have to gain energy to become excited. If I want to become excited, I gain energy. And it moves to a higher energy level. You have to keep this in your head. Here's your nucleus that's positive. Electrons that exist closer to the nucleus have lower energy. Electrons that jump to positions farther away have higher energy. Why? Because they can overcome that positive pulling force. So anytime you move away from the nucleus, you need energy. And that's when we do the flame test. You put the um, either the loop or you put the um, 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 Q-tip, okay, into the flame with the metal ions to excite them, to give them energy. Now they love to ask the opposite way in part two. Why is light given off? Because it jumps where? Yeah, it, it comes from the excited state back. So it's the full story. Here they're just talking about, hey, give me energy, I can pull away from that nucleus. Number one is definitely one, okay? And again, know where you are in these tests. They start with atomic structure. I'm going to go through all, all the units together, too. Which subatomic particle will be attracted by a positively charged object? So we know that different charges attract, OK? So uh, what's going to be attracted to a positively charged? Well, something that is negative, which would be, I think, the electron. Now, if you don't know electrons negatively charged, and I doubt that many of you don't, there is a place that you can figure this out. Many, many teachers don't pull this table out to, but I love this table. And I believe it is the uh, table O. I know it's table O. Let's see if I can go there once I get to my reference table, uh, which I have trouble getting there. Let's get my reference tables out. Uh, so let's see here. We go to, uh, and where's my reference tables? There it is. OK. so. Let's go to table O, as we say in Brooklyn. OK. And here we go. That's table Q. I don't know my letters or my consonants. There's table O. Now, you may say, Mr. Grotsky, where is the electron? Or where did it go? Okay, well, I got too big here. OK, so there's my table O. <laughs> hey, all right. Nice, up and close and personal. And it lists all the particles. Okay, let me say, well, there's no electron. Beta particle is an electron. Notice it's charged, negative one. Bottom number is charge, top number is mass. They put a zero for the electron here or the beta particle, but really it's 2,000 times lighter. Let's continue. But the nice place to look for charges and masses, a proton and a neutron have the same mass. Notice a neutron has no charge. The bottom number is charge. Proton is a mass, mass of one and a charge of one. Electron is a charge of negative one and a mass of zero. Also in table O. Alpha particles are slower, they're heavier, they're two protons, they're plus two, and they have two neutrons. I'm going to get neutrons, you subtract the mass from the proton number or charge number. Two protons, two neutrons, the helium nucleus. Gamma radiation, it's the most dangerous of them all, has no charge and no mass, so it doesn't deflect toward a charge, and because it has no mass, very limited stopping power, which means it can go really through a lot of objects, very dangerous stuff here. Beta particle 
is not as penetrating as a gamma because it has some mass, even if I put a zero here, and it has some charge, so it will bend toward positives. And alpha particles are the least penetrating, or the least dangerous of the three I just mentioned because they're so heavy and have a high charge. Things you can get from table O in this area, all right? Uh, even though it's a nuclear table, it tells you something about atomic structure. My hands are moving, not really sure why. Okay, so not that. Put that aside. That's what I'm working on today. And here we go. Maybe. So, electron. All right, moving forward. Number three. Which conclusion is based on the gold foil experiment and the resulting model of the atom? Well, the gold foil experiment party, people, is one they keep picking up, picking on all the time. Real quickly, what is it all about? The gold foil, if I make some space for myself here, the gold foil is when you take a very thin piece of metal. I'm just going to draw one atom thick. And if you remember this experiment, it pops up all the time. They shot, guess what, alpha particles, which we now know are helium nuclei, which are two neutrons and two protons. So they basically took this particle of two neutrons and two protons, and they shot them through these, uh, these atoms. Most of them went right through. Occasionally, when they got close to the nucleus, they deflected. And even, even, far, even more infrequently, they bounced almost straight back. And this led to the conclusion that the atom, if most of these went right through, is mostly made of empty space. The mass of the atom is a small part of the overall atom called the nucleus. Okay? So they discovered the nucleus of the atom. And when you got close to it, there was deflection. And sometimes you got too close, it bounced back. So they discovered the entire mass is empty space and that, okay, the nucleus is positive, another conclusion. Sometimes they want two conclusions. How they discover it was positive? Well, they knew the alpha particle was positive. These things were deflecting away because the nucleus was positive. So they found that the entire mass of the atom was found in a very small dead center called the nucleus. The rest of it was empty space, and that nucleus was positive. I don't even know what the question reads, but that's what you have to know for this test, for either a part two question or a multiple choice. This could be a part two question. They could say, give me two conclusions, but they're wrapping it up in a multiple choice. The what? The questions are different, the answers are the same. You do enough tests. Let's go back to the test. Which conclusion is based on the model of the atom from this experiment? The atom is mostly empty space and the nucleus is a positive charge. This is what you need to know for that question. Okay, whether it's multiple choice or part two. Okay? Number four, or as we say in North River, four. Okay, which two particles have the same mass? Well, we should already know it's what? proton and a neutron. I'm not going to bore you by over-teaching this, but guess what? If you did not know, go back to table O, because table O will show you that each one, a proton and a neutron, have a mass of one. Okay? The only one I'll say about table O is electron, they put a zero there. It's 2,000 times lighter than a neutron and proton, so they put it a zero there, but just understand that that number does 2,000, does pop up. Number five. Which element has, a, has chemical properties that are most similar to the chemical properties of sodium? If you've got similar properties, and this was first noted by the earlier periodic tables, Dmitry Mendeleev and all the other people who built periodic tables at the time, he was first to publish, okay, notice that atoms of the time, the elements they knew at the time, started, uh, were repeating in their properties. So when he built the periodic table, he noticed that when he line them up according to their differences. At the time, it was atomic mass. The current table, of course, is atomic number. He noticed that all of a sudden, he sort of that the properties of these atoms started repeating. So he put the same type of properties underneath each other. Later on, many years, 60, 70 uh, years later, they realized what made them similar was valence electrons. So if you have similar properties of sodium, okay, which is right here, you must have the same valence electrons or you're in the same family Okay, the alkali metals all have the same one valence electron. So, of course, I'm looking for something in the same group. And, of course, potassium is in that same group. Sim simple question. This could be a part two, too. I've seen this pop up many times. Explain why. Uh, or give me another element, they'll say, that has the same similar properties as sodium. And you could have picked what? Anything that was an alkali metal. I know you've probably got this. But let's go to my re uh, reference table. 
No, it's not there. I'll get this going. Here we go. If we go to our, uh, our periodic table here, okay, and we'll see that I have some stuff written here, but if I go to my periodic table and go to my alkali metals, for those that don't quite get this, these all have one valence electron, and the reasoning is why. The reasoning is they all have one in the outermost shell, and it all gives them that one right there. So they have to be in the same group. By the way, the group number also is valence electrons. Okay, if you go to the right, you want valence electrons. And by the way, valence electrons are those electrons that are available for bonding. It's in the outermost edge. All right. So these have four valence, 2 4, to get the one. 2 5, the outermost electrons available for bonding. Okay, moving forward. So, number six. La, la, la. Germanium is classified as what? Well, first and foremost, what the heck is germanium? I don't know its chemical symbol. So, I could look at table S. And table S would give me atomic number six, and germanium is GE. So, let's go back to our reference table. Now, let's go find GE. Assume you can go to table S and find GE. And there is GE in all of its glory, right there. Now, what is it? Well, you should know the following. On this staircase, boron, silicon, arsenic, tellurium, GE, and antimony. You need to know these are your metalloids. They have properties of the what? Non-metals who are above the staircase. And they have properties of these metals who are to the left and below the staircase. Most of the periodic table, my friends, are metals. So you need to know that germanium, along with boron, silicon, arsenic, tellurium, and antimony, these guys on the staircase, including these two, are metalloids. They have properties of both. Now, they presented the question is, what is germanium? But they could have said, which of the following choices, or they could have switched the question around and said, uh, germanium has what types of properties? Of metals only, of non-metals only, or of both? So if they were asking, who has both properties of non-metals and metals, you're looking for this one that's the line between them, okay? Non-metals, smaller atoms, metals, bigger atoms. What creates that differentiated line is the metalloids. And you should know that non-metals tend to gain electrons because they attract their electrons really strong. They're like OCD, they want electrons, they want to what? Fantasize about more. And here, they're bigger atoms. The bigger atoms are metals. The electrons are farther away from the nucleus, so they tend to lose them which is called oxidation. Metals lose electrons, become positive. Nonmetals gain, become what? Negative. You put them together, and there'll be a transfer because this guy is going to pull them away. I'm giving you more than I need for the question, I know. Okay, moving forward. So that's a metalloid. Or a semi-metal, as we used to call them. Six is two. Number seven. Which statement correctly describes... Okay, cool. All right. Which statement currently describes diamond and graphite, which are different forms of solid carbon? All right, diamond and graphite. These are made of pure carbon. Okay? And we have our diamond, which is basically tetrahedral that repeats. And we have our graphite, which is a different structure. These are both black atoms, which we call carbon. Now, carbon, I don't think, is a black atom, but they, they basically color them that way. Um, in any case... The idea here is that these guys have different structure. In chemistry, structure is king. You change the structure, you change the physical and chemical properties. And you guys know this. Diamond, guy's worst nightmare, okay, uh, or a girl's best friend, I'm not sure, has a different structure and properties than graphite. Graphite we have in what? Graphite we have in our pencils. You can't write with a diamond, can you? It'll cut your paper. It's the hardest subject, hardest matter that we know of. But graphite, you can. Why? Graphite, because of the structure, will slough off on paper. So they have different properties because of their different structure. Okay, what's in your pencils and what people wear as jewelry or uses tips as a drill because it's so hard are 
made of the entire same atom, but the structure drives the property. The structure is king. So they differ in their molecular structure only. Well, they differ in the molecular structure, yes, but they differ in their properties. They differ in their properties only? No, it's connected. You differ in your structure, you differ in your properties. So they differ in their molecular structure and their properties. Okay, number seven is three. I've seen this question pop up many times. Number eight. What is the chemical formula for copper to hydroxide? What does that Roman numeral mean? Well, it means, yes, it's an oxidation state. Now, why do I have it? Because I, sometimes I don't see it. No, copper has two choices. If we go to the reference table again, or our periodic table, copper has two choices. Let's go up close and personal with copper. Up close and personal with my copper. Uh, see you. Can you see it? You can see you. <laughs> now, it's got two choices. Okay? It can be plus one or plus two. So if you say copper oxide, can I draw two different forms of copper oxide? So which one do you have? And if they have two different forms, just like the last question, won't they have two different properties? Yeah, I better know which one I'm asking for. Now, sometimes you don't see that Roman numeral because some compounds, guess what? Only have one choice. So copper, because it can become plus two or plus three, it's telling you I'm dealing with the copper plus two, which would give me its unique formula. So back to the problem. Okay, copper is what charge? It is plus two. They're not telling you the second, the second form. They're telling you exactly it's plus two. If they wanted plus one, it'd be Roman number one. Don't think it's the first or second. And don't think the other things have to be two because of it. Okay? We're dealing with copper that's plus two. Hydroxide. Hydroxide is an OH minus. Now, of course, you deal with this in acid and base all the time. But if you forgot what a hydroxide was, table E is your friend. It lists all of the polyatomic ions. Okay, so hydroxide is something you should know at this point since this is a review. All right, this whole cluster has an ion of, negative, of charge of negative one. This is two, so clearly I need two hydroxides, right, for one, and I'm done. That's all that is. Now, do not pick this one. This means I have two H's for one O. I need two of those clusters, so choice four is the answer. The parentheses tell me that I need two of everything inside. Without the parentheses, okay, as some people would fall apart in, okay, oops, without the parentheses, um, what you would have is you're just saying you have only one of the H's. Okay, so in any case, choice four is the answer for number eight. Number nine, what is the percent composition of mass of aluminum, okay? Now, percent by mass, one of the, um, uh, I would say easier type of math questions. Now, none of the math questions are tough here, but a percent by mass is part over total times 100. Now, part, now what part are they asking for? They're asking for, what is the percent composition of aluminum? Now, they were really nice. They gave me the gram formula mass. What is the gram formula mass? The mass per one mole. If you were to add up two aluminums, three sulfurs, 12 oxygens, right? And you went to the periodic table, you would find that if I had one mole of this guy, it would equal 342 grams. They gave you that. Now, since this is a percentage, it doesn't matter what sample you use, so let's pick one mole. Let's use that number as my total. So my total number is going to be 342. And they're really nice to give this to me. And the part that I'm going to use is what? Aluminum. Now, in one of these, one mole of these, how many aluminums are there? There's two. What's the mass per one aluminum? 27. Now, for those that don't know, all you do is go to the reference table and find the mass of aluminum. Or if you're from England, aluminium. Okay? Strange way they say it. So here's aluminum. It's 27. You round off to the most common isotope. So there's 27. Back to the problem. I've got two of them. So 2 times 27, right, there's two of them. 
So 2 times 27, right, is what? 54? That's my part. So 54 over 340, oops. Keep doing that. I'll learn eventually. 54 over 342 times 100 gives you a percentage. So you take your calculator, very simple. 54 divided by 342 uh, times 100 if you have to. Okay, and you get 15.78, which rounds off to 15.8% choice two, number nine. All that is. That could be clearly a part two question. I've seen that many times. Sometimes a part two question says, hey, give me the grand formula mass of this. Sometimes that could be a two point question because they want to see your work first and the answer. So if you had to come up with this, it's two aluminums plus, how many sulfurs? Three plus four times whatever oxygen is, 16, together. So that, again, many implications for these questions. Number 10. Which statement it describes a chemical property that can be used to distinguish between compound A and compound A? Well, hold on. If I'm a compound A, and this is a compound B, I'm two different compounds, I have two different chemical formulas. I have two different ratio of atoms. Now, I have two different properties, right? My structure is clearly different. Structure is king. So I have two different properties. Now I could have two different chemical properties and I have different physical properties. Let's go look at the choices. Now, what statement describes a chemical property though they're asking for? Okay, so they want a chemical property, which is gonna be different. Well, this is a question about knowing what's a physical and what's a chemical. Now a chemical property is something that you can look at the compound and see if it can change itself. A chemical property is the ability of the chemical to break bonds and form new ones. So chemical properties are properties where you're looking at are you making a new substance. For instance, these guys are called noble gases. Their chemical property is that they lack the ability to react to things. So they don't react. So their chemical property is that they're inert. Okay. The chemical property of alkali metals is they're explosive with water. They love to make hydrogen gas with water, okay? Now, blue or white colors are not chemical properties because when you look at the color of something, you're not distinguishing if it can be what? Made into something new, or you're not breaking bonds to distinguish that. When I look at the color of something, am I creating a new substance to, to see the color? No, that's physical. Melting points, phase changes are physical. When you melt water from an ice to a liquid, are you changing the chemical composition? It's still two H's and one O. So melting and phase changes are physical. Dissolving, physically dissolving something is also a, um, a, a physical change. But here is the answer. It does not burn in air. It has no ability to react to make something new with air. So that's why four is the answer. Okay, one, two, and three were physical because you were not creating or talking about the ability to create something new, whereas four was. So 10 is a chemical change. Number 11. Which compound contains both ionic and covalent bonds? Ah, classic regions qu chemistry question. Now, if I'm, if I'm containing both ionic and covalent bonds, first and foremost, okay, I'm looking for a polyatomic ion. Now, why? Well, if I look at calcium carbonate, number one, okay, calcium, and let's, let, let's do it below it. Let's do it below. Let's squash this a little bit. The only compounds that can have both ionic and covalent are things that are polyatomic ions. Let me explain. Uh, now, who has a polyatomic ion? Only one. Cluster of nonmetals. Okay. Cluster of nonmetals that's charged. So, calcium is plus two. Carbonate is negative two. The reason why it's one calcium for one carbonate is because one is plus two, one is negative two. And salts are nothing more than ions attracting each other, and they write them in their lowest ratio, which is empirical. Because they don't make molecules, they make crystals. 
and the crystals are at their lowest. When we identify a crystal of calcium carbonate, okay, we care about the ratio of ions in the crystal. They don't make molecules. Now, if you didn't know carbonate was a cluster of nonmetals, you would go to table E, so let's quickly go, go there. So table E is sometimes I call the what the heck is that table, because some people don't know what these clusters of nonmetals are, and it's okay. It'll be all right. And here's table E, what the heck is that? And we can see our carbonate is listed there, right here. And it's a polyatomic ion. Now, the thing is, this carbonate attracts the sodium. Sodium is plus, carbonate's negative, an ionic bond is a bond between ions. You should know that. But within the, the polyatomic ion, between the O and the C, are two nonmetals. So between the O and the C and the polyatomic ion, you're dealing with a covalent bond. You should know that. Why? Two nonmetals have what kind of attractive forces? For electrons. Two nonmetals. Yeah, two nonmetals. What kind of size of radii do nonmetals have? Small. Right, so that means they attract their electrons tightly, which means if you put electrons between them, they're going to be fighting for them. They're forced to share. Me and you have a tug of war. You're a pretty strong guy. I like to think I'm strong. So we have a tug of war. If we're both strong for the rope, you're not going to pull this away from me. I'm not going to pull this away from you, so we're forced to share. In an ionic bond, if I put the rope in front of my three-year-old son, okay, I'll rip it right away, because I'm going to be like the non-metal, be stronger, higher electronegativity, and there's going to be a transfer. But here, they're forced to share. So this is a covalent bond between non-metals inside the polyatomic ion. And that's what gives you the second bond. So all you're looking for is a polyatomic ion in that kind of a question. So between this is the ionic bond, but between the nonmetals, okay, is the covalent. None of these have any polyatomic ions. So number 11 is choice one. Okay? Number 12, which formula is a nonpolar molecule? All right, now anytime I teach about nonpolar molecules, I'm thinking about, you know, they're talking about, when it's, I hear the word nonpolar, polar, I'm thinking about, are they talking about the bond or the molecule? So many people get, cro get, get crossed up here because they don't know the difference between a bond and a molecule. They're tied together, but they are different. Now, in this case, we're talking about a nonpolar molecule. So let me make some room here, as I've been doing before. Okay, so I'm going to make some room here. Let's talk about a nonpolar molecule. Now, what does this mean? This means that I have a molecule, okay, and it's a draw molecule, it's not a, it's not a crystal, it's a molecule, that has an equal distribution of electrons, meaning one side of the molecule doesn't have more electrons than another. So there's no poles, there's no difference. If I was to draw a polar molecule, a polar molecule would have more electrons on one side than another. And we call this unequal distribution of electrons this side would be negative or partial negative. This side would be partial positive because it kind of lost negatives. So polar molecules have an unequal distribution of electrons. This is the negative side. This is the positive side. Now, they want something nonpolar, but I'm teaching the entire subject matter here. What creates a polar molecule? What creates this idea that we have unequal distribution? Well, my friends in chemistry, what, is, what it teaches you here is that you need to have a polar bond. What creates a polar molecule is somewhere in the molecule you must be sharing un electrons unequally, and that's called a polar bond. So to be a polar molecule, I know they're looking for a nonpolar, but let's just put that to be a polar molecule, you must have polar bonds. Must have polar bonds. Two, you can't have symmetry. Now, symmetry, I'm not sure why I put an LB in there. Symmetry, oops, I knew I shouldn't have done that. Symmetry, okay, is being the same all the way around. Many ways to explain this, but, and in the most simplistic terms, if you have symmetry, okay, your polar bonds could cancel. So if you have a polar bond, okay, let's go find out what's polar first. What is a polar bond? What, what is a, how do I identify a bond that actually creates an unequal sharing? Well, me and you again, we're tugging on a, on a rope, right? Yeah. But you're a little stronger than me. 
You're not strong enough to pull a rope away and become an ionic bond. We're still sharing, but you pull a rope closer to you because you're a little stronger, a little more electronegative. Two different people will not have the same strength. You both can be strong, but someone's probably a little stronger. Same thing with atoms. Two different nonmetals will have two different electronegativities. The one that is more electronegative pulls the rope closer. So a polar bond is two different nonmetals. That's all. So these all have polar bonds. They all could be polar. But if you're symmetrical, the same all the way around, what does that mean? Your polar bonds will cancel. For instance, look at CF4 for a second. Does that have polar bonds? And they can ask that. Does CF4 have polar bonds? Are they two different nonmetals? Yeah. Right. So they are polar bonds. But because they're symmetrical, the same all the way around, think with me for a second. If you're, un if you're sharing electrons unequally in all directions, isn't your unequalness equal in all directions? Yeah. Therefore, there's no side that's more negative than another. So the nonpolar molecule is your CH4 because it has symmetry that cancels out its unequalness by being unequal in all directions. Now, if you look closely at a CF bond, I know this is the answer, number four. If you draw a CF bond right here, just one of them, you notice the pair of electrons are where? Closer to the? Right, because the fluorine is more electronegative. This is a 4.0, this is a 2.6, it's sharing unequally. Okay, all the things you'll see. So number 12, the nonpolar molecule is the one that's symmetrical, that cancels its polar bonds. These guys are not symmetrical. They have polar bonds and they're asymmetrical, so they're all polar, which means there's going to be some unequalness, okay, or some place where there's an electron-rich area. Okay, so 12 is number 4. Number 13. I think I hit number 13. Crazy. Okay, number 13. When a lithium atom forms a lithium ion, a lithium atom does what? So we have a lithium atom, which we know means neutral, protons equal electrons, becomes a lithium at ion. How do I become an ion? How did lithium become plus one? No, it did so. It did so because it gained an electron or lost an electron. Yeah, exactly correct. You'd lose an electron. And we'd write the electron right here if this was redox. Okay? So lithium atom, which was neutral, protons equal electrons, becomes an ion that's positive. And when you become positive, it's because you lose your negatives. You lost an electron. Okay? Guess what? Lithium is a metal. You should know metals are big fat radii where electrons are so far away from their nucleus they're easily what? Lost. Elect metals lose electrons and are oxidized. Okay, if you become positive, by the way, you can't be a proton. Why can't you be a proton? Because if you gain the proton, would it, still, it would not still be lithium. What makes lithium lithium is atomic number three, three protons. We don't lose and gain protons. 13 is choice four. Number 14. Which Lewis, which a, a Lewis electron dot dot represents a boron atom in the ground state? Well, these dots represent valence electron. Okay, so we need valence electron. So let's go find boron, don't be one. So let's go to a reference table. Boom, let's be smaller. Okay, and I can, if I knew my alphabet, I'd be, I'd be pretty golden here. But here we go. Maybe. There we go. And let's go find boron. Get these guys out of the way. Edit, delete. And boron is right there. Let's get up close and personal with boron. It's a non-metal, as we talked about. And how many valence electrons does boron have? Three. Yes, it does. Three. Two dash three. The outmost three. So, how many dots do I need? Three. It's just that simple. Three dots. So clearly, okay, two is the answer. Now, if they ask you to draw a Lewis dot diagram of boron. As long as you put the dots, three dots anywhere, it's correct. It doesn't have to be in a certain place. 
they wanted the ion of boron, you'd have to make sure you put the right number of dots. So number 14 is 215. Samples prepared by comparing dissolving, completely dissolving, and that's a key word here. If you're completely dissolving party people, that means that you are definitely making a solution. And you should know a solution is a homogeneous mixture. Home means the same. If you completely dissolve something, the first drop is the same as the last. Right? So if you have Coke or Pepsi, whatever you like to drink, the first drop better be the same as the last. If it's not, someone backwashed and you drink. Okay? And it's not a solution. That'd be heterogeneous or the hard stuff. So completely dissolved means you made a solution, which I can denote as AQ. And you should know that solutions are homogeneous mixtures. By the way, are gases solutions? Is the air I'm breathing right now, is that a solution? It better be, because if it's not, I could walk into a, a pocket of no oxygen. We don't, we don't mind our own business and walk into a pocket of no oxygen. Why? Because the air mixes evenly. So we can consider gases and air to be homogeneous mixtures, because gases will what? Uniformly fill containers and mix evenly with each other. So a solution is what they were after in that question. 15 is 2. Number 16. Which form of energy is converted to, uh, to thermal energy when propane burns in air? Okay, well, when propane burns in air, you're starting with chemicals. So the chemical energy within the bonds somehow gets released, so it's chemical. All right, nuclear energy would be from the nucleus. Electrical is if you had a battery, a voltaic cell, forcing a reaction to go. So you're, it's a chemistry test, so guess what? It's the chemical energy. It's the energy of the bonds. You're starting with a chemical propane, and it's releasing energy. 16 is 4. Kind of a simple question. Don't overthink these. 17. Which physical changes are endothermic? Now, when you think of endothermic changes, I think of the heating and cooling curve. So my friends in chemistry, I visualize this every time. Well, maybe not, but you should maybe. This is my solid. This is my liquid, and this is my gas, tremendous energy. This is a solid going to a liquid. This is a liquid going to a gas. Okay, well, what's endothermic mean? You should know endothermic means that you're taking in energy. Your environment gets cooler because you're taking energy from the environment to make something happen. If this was A plus B going to C, I know these are, these are physical changes, the heat would be on the, pro the reactant side here because you need it. But in any case, Okay, we're looking for a phase change that climbs the energy. Liquids have more energy than solids. Gases have more energy than liquids. Gases fly around hundreds of miles an hour. So which phase change do you need energy? Or which phase change is going up the ladder? Well, melting and freezing can't be endothermic. Melting, a solid going to a liquid, is climbing the energy ladder. So that's endothermic. Freezing is liquid to solid is exothermic, you're going down the energy ladder. So that can't be it. Melting and evaporating is your winner. To melt, you need energy. If a solid go to a liquid, you need energy. For a liquid to go to a gas, you need energy. Last time I checked, you put on the stove to boil. So these two are climbing the energy ladder because they're absorbing energy. Something that melts needs energy. Ice cubes needs energy to melt. Something that boils needs energy to do so. 17 is two. Exothermic, of course, is going down the energy ladder, releasing the extra energy you had. Number 18. Which transfer of energy occurs when an ice cubes are placed in water that's a temperature of 45? Well, we know that an ice cube, okay, when it's at its melting point, this is kind of like what we just did, at its phase change temperatures, let's go down there for a second, run up 30, got a little zealous here. Where was I? Right here. So if it's at its, if it, the ice cubes are melting, so they're at what temperature? The melting point of ice cube, you just take this temperature going across, is zero. So I can probably uh, assume that my ice cube is about at zero. And how does heat flow? Heat flows from high to low, always, from high motion to low motion. So I know that energy is going to go from the warmer surroundings into the ice cube. So, chemical energy is transferred. Now, 
you should know that the melting of ice, which is H2O solid, going to H2O liquid is not a chemical change because the chemical formula is not changing. These are physical changes. You need to know that phase changes, solid to liquid, liquid to gas, gas to liquid, sublimation, deposition, evaporation, all those are phase changes where you're not changing the chemical what? Formula. So these are not going to be chemical energy converted. It's just going to be motion energy. The thermal energy is transferred from the warmer solution, which is um, the water, because the temperature of the water is 45, to the ice, choice 4, always from high to low. Okay, so 18 is 4. 19. At STP, I call this the same, same problem. It's Avogadro's hypothesis. You've seen this question before. You just forgot. Okay, if you have equal volumes of two different gases, this could be, what, five liters of helium. If I have an equal volume of another container that's also five liters, and let's say this is argon, because if they're at the same temperature and pressure, they have the same number of molecules inside. So if I have four liters of oxygen, it has the same number of molecules as four liters of any other gas. Same volume, same number of molecules. I call it the same, same problem. It's Avogadro's hypothesis, right? And you know this to be true because you know that one mole is 22.4 liters at STP. One mole of any gas is 22.4 liters. So if I have 22.4 liters of any gas, I have the same number of particles. That's how it works. Same, same problem. Okay, number 20, maybe. What are the total number of electron pairs that are shared between two carbon atoms in ethine? Well, eth means two carbons. I know that from table P. Ine is triple bonded from table what? Table Q. By the way, they give you that exact one. Why not go there as long as I can find it? So table Q and P, well, there's F. I got lucky, I guess. There's my two carbons. But my I, which I circled here as my, un, my, my unsaturated, have a triple bond here. So question reads, I believe, how many pairs? How many pairs of electrons? Well, you should know, party people, that one dash represents a pair of electrons. So three dashes really are three pairs of electrons. A dash represents a pair. So they ask for electron pairs. There are three bonds in an ion, and therefore there are three pairs, choice three. 21. Which pair of compounds are isomers? Iso means same. Okay, so these are the same chemical formulas but different structure. So what I'm looking for is something with the same number of atoms but different structure. So I can look at number one and cross it off. This has two N's, this has one N. This has two P's, this has four P's. Let's look at choice three. I have one carbon, this has got two carbons. Answer has to be four, but let's check it out. Number four, this one is C2H6O. This is C2H6, right? I'm counting the H's, and an O. These have the same molecular formula, different structural formulas. Therefore, they give different chemical and physical properties. 21 is 4. Number 22, which organic compound is unsaturated? If it's unsaturated, party people, that means, if you go to table, uh, Q here, we're talking about something that's not, not holding on to the max amount of H's. So alkenes and alkynes. The carbon makes double bonds here. It doesn't have enough what? Bonds to make with H's. So as you add more bonds between the carbons, it holds less H's. It's unsaturated. So I'm looking for something with a double or triple bond. Okay. So I'm looking for an alkene or an ine. And there's my ene. Everybody else is a what? An ane, which means single bonds between the carbons. So the one that has less H's because of its what? Double bond, carbons make four bonds. There's your unsaturated hydrocarbon, choice four. Number 23, which oxidation number indicates oxidation? If you forget, Leo, the line says, grr, losing electrons is oxidation. 
metals oxidize. For instance, we just did one before. Lithium, metal, atom, protons equal electrons, become lithium plus one, plus an electron. Oxidation means you're losing negatives. You're losing negatives, so your charge does what? Goes up. When you get reduced, you gain electrons. If you gain electrons, your charge has to drop. So we're looking for an oxidation state change where the numbers go up, like metals do. Negative 1 to positive 2, that looks like it going up. Negative 1 to negative 2, you're going down. Positive 2 to negative 3, you're going down. Positive 3 to positive 2, going down. The only choice that's different is the one that's going up. Okay? And that is your oxidation. If you're losing negatives, your charge goes up. Number 24. Given the redox reaction, as the reaction takes place, there's a transfer of what? Redox, my friends, in chemistry is about reduction, and that's gaining electrons, right? Is reduction, and oxidation, which is losing electrons. So someone's losing them, someone's gaining them. So it's about the electrons, never the protons, silly. Now, the question is, who's gaining what to what? So here's what we do here. I'm looking at my aluminum, my standalone. What's its oxidation state if it stands alone? Zero, because the protons equal electrons. So aluminum zero is going to go to aluminum plus three, plus three electrons. Notice I put that in there. A negative three and a plus three gives me what? Zero on both sides, half reactions. So guess what? The aluminum is going to give off the electrons. And what's chromium going to do? Chromium plus three is going to what? gain them to become chromium zero. So if you knew nothing, standalone metals can only oxidize. Metals that are neutral can only lose electrons because they're big fat radii as we talked about. Chromium plus three, its charge is going what? Down. So it's gaining electrons. So the aluminum's giving electrons to the chromium plus three, choice one. The one who oxidizes, the one who's losing electrons, is giving it to the one who is gaining. Okay? Always. And then you learn about voltaic cells or electrolytic cells, you learn electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. And the anode is the place of what? Anox. Oxidation. The one who loses is the one who gives them away, and the one who is the cathode, red cat, reduces, gains them. So, of course, it's aluminum to Cr plus 3, choice 1, number 24. Number 25. The compound HNO3 can be described as, well, I see that H in front that screams to me acid. Screams to me acid. All right, so therefore, it's an acid. But get the base. Now, I should know three things are electrolytes. Acids, bases, and what else is electrolyte? A salt, fancy word for ionic compound. What do they all produce? They all produce free what? Free ions. This acid gives off what? An H plus. What does a base give off? OH minus. What does a salt give off? It gives off whatever the charges of the ionic compounds are, if it's sodium chloride. And if you have free ions, you can conduct. Now, don't get crazy with Arrhenius. This is the easiest definition. To be an acid, you produce H pluses in solution. That's it. So anything that's an acid is an Arrhenius acid. Well, I should say anything, the earliest definition, I should say, of the acids is to give a proton. So it's definitely an acid. And guess what? All acids have to be electrolytes because they produce free ions. So 25 is 1. Don't get your feathers in a flutter about Arrhenius. Oh, I don't know the name. The easiest definition. And if you didn't know this was an acid, there is a place you could have looked. Why not? Table, is it K? There it is. In all of its glory, there it is. It's a acid right there. So the one we would deal, dealt with. Okay, moving forward. 26. According to reference table M, mm -mm, good. What is the color of the indicator methyl orange in a solution as a pH of 2? 
This is reading right off the reference table. Let's go to reference table M. Okay? And the pH is 2. And if I can know the alphabet, I can probably do this. Here we can, oh, no, get one more. That's R. Here we go. I'll get there eventually. Okay, so reference table M. And let's get rid of this other markings here. Okay, so my friends in chemistry, my pH, I believe, was 2, right? Is that what it was? Okay, so anything less than 3.1 is, guess what? Red. Anything 3.1 lower is red. Anything 4.4 and higher is yellow. That's how you use it. Anything in between is the color in between. Red and yellow is probably orange. The ones you have to know between yellow and blue are green, okay? So we're th less than 3.1, so we're in that red region. So we're red. And I'm like, really? That's a question. <laughs> really? There's a few, there's a lot of reallys on this test. Don't overthink it. Okay, number 27. Take it and run. Actually, you see, keep going. 27. In this reaction, ammonia molecules act as a base because they what? This is the other definition, but they don't mention it by name. But watch what happens. I call this side the current. I call this the future. In the future, this has how many more H's? In the future, what, did this, what happened to this guy? It gained an H. So somehow, some way, it gained an H. Guess what? The acid does what? Donates the H to the ammonia. What you're left with is Cl negative, who attracts what? NH4 plus. So in this reaction, ammonia molecules act as a base because they accept the H pluses. That's the other definition. HCl is acting as an acid because it's what? Donating H plus. So to figure out who's donating H plus or who's losing, see what they become in the future. This had one more H, so it's accepting an H. And accepting H's are bases, okay? For instance, if you've got like a, a lot of acids in your environment, these things are very corrosive. If you've got a base, look at a hydroxide. What can it do? Accept that H plus to make water and neutralize the acids. So number 27 is one. Okay, 28. Are we good? Am I going too fast? Am I going, am I good enough speed? All right, yeah, all right, cool. So number 28, if I can ever get there. Okay, natural transmutation. Transmutation is describing a nuclear change in the nucleus. You're mutating your nucleus because your nucleus was unstable, so it gave off. Now, why is it unstable? It could be too many protons. It could be too many neutrons, too less neutrons, some kind of um, instability with the nucleus. So you're going to pick a nuclear reaction. Now, nuclear reactions are not the same as chemical reactions. Now, all of these are nuclear reactions. Now, what's natural transmutation? Natural transmutation is when an element, unstable, by itself, emits a particle and its nucleus changes. This is the only choice where something by itself gave off an alpha particle in this example. Table O would help you if you didn't know that. And became this. Now, in part two, my friends in chemistry, they may ask you to complete this. And it's very simple. They may say, hey, plutonium, Okay, 239, fill out the rest. I'd go to table N, it would tell me that helium is an alpha particle. Then I know four plus what number is 239? 35. Right, and then I know if this is 94 on this side, and I know the alpha particles too, two plus what is 94? Then I go to my periodic table, look up 92, and that's uranium. Okay, it's that simple. Now all of these are artificial. Why are these artificial transmutation? Because most of these need um, some kind of particle accelerator. When you run through a field to pick flowers, which you're going to do today, I'm sure, okay? Pick some wildflowers after chem review. You go, you, you look at the babbling brook, you look at the, the beautiful field in front of you, and then you see the particle accelerator in nature. No, you don't. You, you don't see a particle accelerator in nature. So this is usually occurring in some kind of equipment that is not happening in nature. We make this happen. So anytime you see two or more substances in a nuclear equation, 
they're forced to collide, and that's not natural. Okay? It's when they're by themselves happening. So number one is natural transmutation. 29. Which statement best describes gamma radiation? Ah, I talked about that in table O. If you look at table O, it gives you the gamma symbol, it gives you the mass of zero, and it gives you the charge of zero. So it has a mass of zero and a charge of zero. If those of you that didn't pick or just chimed in, okay, look at table O, and you'll see that very quickly. As long as I know my alphabet, which is challenging, it seems for me today. And there's my gamma right there in the middle. Let's get up close and personal with it. Gamma radiation right there. Look at the charge. No, is the mass number at the top? No mass and no charge. Okay, that's why it's the most penetrating of all, the most dangerous of all the uh, emissions from nuclei. Okay, so clearly choice number 29 is 3. Number 30, the last, well, almost the last, I guess, of this, this section. Which change takes place in a nuclear fission, fusion reaction? Now, fusion means you're taking light nuclei and you're slamming together artificially and making them fuse. Okay? Now, all nuclear reactions, believe it or not, have some missing mass. All of these have missing mass something that maybe a teacher talked about. And this famous equation, E equals mc squared. Energy equals the matter times the speed of light squared. That's Einstein's equation. Speed of light's huge. Times it by square it, it's even bigger. Times it by a little mass. So a little tiny mass creates a lot of energy. And what happens at nuclear reactions is that we actually have a little bit of missing mass. We call that called mass defect. So all nuclear equations are missing some matter. The more mass you're missing, now it's very tiny, the more energy given off. So back to the question. Okay, what's take, what takes place in a nuclear reaction? Well, we're missing some matter, which, which gets, gets converted to the energy. Okay, you had to know that nuclear reaction, there's something called mass defect. Mass defect means that there's a piece of the matter, and it's tied to the binding energy that gets uh, rearranged when you split atoms, in this case, when you slam atoms together. Okay, so in case of nuclear fusion, it gives off more energy than nuclear fission. Fission is splitting the atom, therefore more matter is missing. Now, energy converted to matter, this would be a particle accelerator. They wouldn't put that ever. So matter is converted to energy in nuclear equations. Number 31. Now these are the part two questions, or these are the B two, uh, number ones. These tend to be a little more um, harder two-step problems. So if you feel like you have to look something extra, do some extra work here, you're right. These ones are what they're built upon. 31, total number of neutrons. Hey, we're starting all over again. Notice you finished in nuclear chemistry, which was your last unit. Now we're starting all over again. So they start from atomic structure, go through all the units back to nuclear, and now they kind of reset the dial, okay? So know where you are in the test. That might help you. 31, total number of neutrons in a nucleus of a neutral atom has 19 electrons and a mass number of 39. Well, you should know this. I don't care what my element number is, okay? If I'm a neutral atom, atomic number is what? 19 because my electrons equal the protons. You should know, when I say atom, the proton number, which is the atomic number, has to equal the electrons. That's why it's neutral. So atomic number 19 is potassium. So when you say I have potassium, I say how many electrons? Well, it would be 19 electrons. So I know that's atomic number 19 here. It's the protons. Now, the mass number is 39. How do I get neutrons? Remember, the mass number is the protons and the neutrons. In table O, only the protons and neutrons have a mass number. The electrons don't. So the top number is protons and neutrons. The bottom number, which they said is electrons, is really the protons because it's an atom. They're the same. So 39 minus 19 is 20, and that's the answer. You cool with that? Yeah. Okay? The key to the question was telling you it's a neutral atom, and they said it had 19 electrons. That told me right away must have 19 protons, okay? Two-step problem there. 
That's why, that's why this is a little harder, these questions. Go a little slower here. An unknown element X can form a compound with the form of XBr3. Which group on the periodic table would form the X be found? Well, if Br3 is at the end and the X is in front, bromide has to be negatively charged. Now, the reason why I know that is because if I look at bromide or look at any of the halogens and I go to my periodic table, okay, and I go to my bromide, let's get this out of the way. Make this up close and personal here for my bromide. It has a bunch of oxidation states, but it only has one negative choice. So it has to be negative one. All your halogens only have one negative choice. So if they're at the other end of the molecule, something in front is probably positive. So knowing that, I know the charge of my X. How do I know? Negative one individually. There's three of them. Negative three overall, the bottom numbers have to equal zero. This thing needs to be plus three. Since there's only one X, individually this X is plus three. I'm looking for something in which group is plus three. Now, if you don't know, you go back to the reference table. Who becomes plus three? Ro group what? 13. They have three valence. They tend to lose their valence, become plus three. So it's going to be something that likes to become plus three. So we go and see that group 13 likes to become plus 3. That's the answer. So you can see that these problems have a little more to them. So you definitely want to focus a little harder, okay? Not ter ter terrifically harder, but there's definitely a little more to them. 33, as, oops, as elements in group 17, let me make it a little small here. Elements in group 17 of the periodic table are considered from top to bottom. What happens to the atomic radius and the metallic character? Okay, I love this question. That's why I have this periodic table above me. Okay, so we're in group 17, but I can be any group. What happens? What happens to the size of the radii? Right. And you know why, because as you add electrons to what? Other shells? Okay, they have to get bigger, or as you fill shells of electrons, it's harder for the nucleus to feel the outermost electrons, right? So the electrons are able to go farther away. So you're filling shells or electrons don't feel a nucleus because of the inner shells, because of the shielding effect. Either way, atomic radius increases. You should know that. And you should know metals lose electrons and oxidize. Why? Because they're big atoms. Their electrons are so far away from their nucleus, they're easy to lose. They don't attract them. So your metallic properties or character always increases when you go down and to the left because down to the left you're getting bigger. Electrons are farther away from the nucleus, held looser. Definition of a metal is the ability to lose electrons, essentially. A big atom is a metal by definition. So your radius, of course, gets bigger because of the shielding effect that we just explained or adding electrons to the shells or Okay, and the metallic character have to increase. So the atomic radius and the metallic area both increase as they go from top to bottom. That bothers some people because, say, Mr. Grodsky, group 17, isn't that the halogens? Isn't that nonmetals? Yeah, but you can say, even though iodine's a nonmetal, it has the most metallic, what, properties. I can do the same thing over here. These are really active metals, so active they're not found in nature. But who's the most nonmetallic of Lithium to sesium. You can say lithium because it's smaller. Same idea. Okay? Number 34. Which pair of compounds has the same empirical formula? Empirical means lowest ratio. Simple as that. C2H2 is going to be what? CH. And what's C6H6? C what? Don't they both reduce to 1 to 1? That's it, nothing more. Empirical, they, they both are divisible by themselves, one to one. So number 34 is one. The rest of these will not do that. 35, another question like, really, really? 35, which equation shows conservation of mass? Conservation of mass means you have the same type and same number of atoms on both sides. What they're really saying is which one's balanced? That's what balancing is. One sodium, two chlorines, two chlorines, that's not balanced. 
one aluminum, two bromides, three bromides, not balanced. Okay, two H's, one O, two O's, one O on this side, not balanced. Okay, clearly, this is balanced. You have one P on this side. On the product side, you have one P. You have five chlorines, and you have two plus three, five chlorines on both sides. Both sides have one phosphorus and five chlorines. That's the one that's balanced. 35 is fo or four. Next question. 36. How many electrons are in iron plus two? Ion. Okay, what I do is go find me the electrons in pure iron first. So I go find my iron, my ferrum here, and I look at this and iron up close and personal, atomic number 26. That's got 26 protons and how many electrons? If it's an atom, protons have to equal to what? Electrons. So it's got 26 electrons starting out. It equals the protons. Remember that other question we just had? Very similar to that. So this has got 26 protons. Now, when it becomes plus two, my friends, does it gain two protons? No. No, it loses. Metals are big fat radii. They lost how many electrons? It lost two, and now it has 24. I know what you meant. Okay? Now, if it was plus three, you would lose three, and now you'd be left with what? 23. You start out with 26. You're going to lose two. Metals lose electrons. Why? They're big fat radii. It's the same stuff over and over again. So the answer is, it started out with 26. It's going to lose two in the example they give me. So I'm, I have 24 left. That's simple. So again, 24 is the answer. 36 is one. 37. A substance that does not conduct electricity as a solid, but does conduct electricity when it's melted, is most likely classified as what? Ah, they love to pick on this. Okay, electrolytes are things that conduct when they're melted or aqueous but never in a solid. My friends in chemistry, ionic compounds are positives attracting negatives and they make crystals. They do not make molecules. They're not molecular. We use empirical formulas like sodium chloride is a one-to-one. -one. But when it's in the solid phase, the ions are not free. Not free. They can't move to conduct electricity. You have to have ions that move. Why? Well, because if they can move, okay, for instance, if these ions are free to move, if I put something negative over here and I have free ions, the, the positive ions could migrate over. The negative ions won't. And all of a sudden, I've got a negative side. I'll say it again. If I've got positive negative ions equally interdispersed in my area, and I put something negative over here in a solution, all the positive ions would migrate and would leave this side of the beaker or this container negative. You just conducted the charge from here to there by the ions moving. But an ionic solid, my friends in chemistry, the ions are locked in a crystal. They can't move. So you have to know that ionic compounds never conduct in a solid. But if they're dissolved or melted into free ions, then they can conduct. That is something that pops up a lot. Okay, so it's an ionic compounds can conduct or electrolytes in aqueous or melted molten state, but never in a solid. So NaCl aqueous is an electrolyte, NaCl liquid is an electrolyte, but not the solid. That comes up a lot. 37 is one. That's a core concept. 38. According to reference table H, what is the boiling point of ethanoic acid? at 80 kilopascals. Now what's a boiling point? Boiling point is when the liquid's vapor pressure, which is the force of liquid molecules going up, equals the force pushing down. The force pushing down is atmospheric pressure. So they're saying the atmospheric pressure is 80 kilopascals. So guess what kind of pressure I need up for it to boil? 80, not the same, just gotta match it. Yeah, that's it. It doesn't have to be more. Once it, once it matches, it's going to boil. So all you need to look in table H is find 80 kilopascals and find me that temperature for ethanoic acid. So let's go there. Table H. Okay. I don't think I'm getting better with my alphabet. H. Here we go. So table H in all of its glory and ethanoic acid is here. All I'm going to do is... Uh, at 80 what? They said 80 kilopascals. 
So the vapor pressure has to be 80. There it is. 60, right? 70, 80 is right here. So I'll go 80, this line right here. Oh, pretty close. That's your ethanoic acid. If you didn't know, just zoom down. Okay. Now what temperature does it boil? Well, it looks like the bottom numbers go by fives, I think. This is 105, 110, 115, 120. Yeah, so by fives. So it's, I don't know, probably 111, 112. You see that? Pretty simple stuff. You're just going to match the temperature to that pressure because that vapor pressure equals the boiling point. Okay, so uh, what do I get there? Is it 111 I said? Yeah, give me three. Oh, pictures, love it. Which part represents a pure substance? You don't love it if you forgot what a substance is. A substance is an element or a compound. That's it, element or compound. Now, element is the same type of atoms. Compounds are two or more atoms. This, my friend, is a pure substance. It's made of a compound. How do I know? Two or more different atoms, and a compound has a what? Distinct chemical formula, only one ratio. So this is one small black atom to one big clear atom. This is a mixture of two different atoms. They didn't want a mixture. Mixtures are not substances. Why not? Why can't a mixture be a substance? A mixture is made up of two or more substances. They want one substance, so a mixture can't be a substance. You need two or more things to be mixed, right? So one is the answer. Let's look at the other choices. This is a mixture of atoms. This is a diatomic atom. This is a mixture of elements. And this is a mixture of elements. So there's, there's, if they just drew me just a box of the same element, that could have been a substance as well. But this is my substance. One thing, one compound, one type of molecule. 39 is choice one. 40. 40. A sample of helium gas that has a volume of 900 milliliters and a pressure of 2.5 and a 298. What's the new pressure? Hey, this is a gas law question. Okay? I'll wipe some stuff out, get some room here. Okay? Gas law question, classic gas law. Now, if you don't know where to look, table T shows you your only gas law place to write, and that is PV over T equals PV over T. Your temperature has to be in Kelvin. Okay, they were nice enough to give that, so let's just plug this stuff in. I call this current scenario, current, that follows the future. So, has a volume of 900. So we're starting with a volume right here. I'm just going to plug that in. 900 milliliters. Okay, it has a pressure of 2.5 atmospheres, ATM, over a temperature of what? Uh, 298. Be careful, make sure you get the right numbers together, Kelvins. Now, in the future, all of this is going to change. What's the new pressure? That's our unknown, P. That's our X, if you want to do that. Temperature changed to 336 Kelvin and the volume is decreased to 450 milliliters. So now, it's just a math question. Now some people have trouble with this. What I would do to both sides is multiply both sides by 336 and 450 over that. The reason I do that is, um, oops, I did it the other way, sorry. Sorry, sorry, oops, Christmas in July. Let's go back down. Let's wipe this out. I got that mixed up. I'm trying to explain. Sometimes I'm tall. Okay, so I'd multiply. I'd multiply this side by 450, and this side by 336. Okay, and I do that to both sides. All right, 450 and 336. Okay, so it cancels. Or here's how I really would do it. Okay, since I've done al since you guys have done algebra, sorry, since you guys have done algebra a lot, okay, the way that I go about it at this point as a review is I know that everything on top goes to the bottom. So when I algebraically, this will go to the bottom, this will go to the top. So what I'm left with is P is equal to. And I'm going to rewrite this. 
2.5 ATM over 900 milliliters, okay, over 336 Kelvin, that went to the top, okay, over 298 Kelvin, that was already there, and this 450 went to the bottom algebraically. And what you'll notice, party people, is that the uh, temperature Kelvin cancels, the milliliters cancel, you're left with atmospheres. And what you do now is take your calculator, and be careful here, you take your 2.5 times 900 times um, 336, divide by, but careful, put it in parentheses, parentheses of these two numbers. Don't just do one at a time. So parentheses, if you can, 298 times 450. Okay, now, if you just cross-multiplied your heart out and you got, okay, your pressure to equal something close to 5.63, uh, 7, that's good enough for me if you work that out mathematically. By the way, the closest answer, if you round off, okay, is choice 3. So it's a plug and chug. They gave you all the values you plugged in. I kind of held your hand a little bit with the math, but I think you guys should be good at this point. Number three is the answer. Next question. 